everyone, welcome back. It's Professor Hall, and today we're talking about point of view. Um, so I want to go through first and talk about um, the pronouns used with each point of view, and um, then the different types of narration that can be done, times that you would use them, times that you might not want to use them, so the benefits and the limitations. And then um, I've actually this time typed up some examples um, same story told from all the different points of view that we're going to be discussing. So you, we could then talk a little bit about what works, what doesn't, which point of view you might want to use for that scene. So um, first, when we look at point of view, we have singular and we have plural. Plural is not used very often, but I mention it because there are a few stories that use plural points of view. Um, it's a really interesting effect. So first, first person would be using pronouns like I, me, my, myself. Second person, singular, you and your. And third person would be he, she, it and then uh, the words that those substitute substitute for. So Jane, Tom, the tree, etc. So that is first person um, told from me, second person told directly to my reader, and third person told about the subject matter. It's essentially um, one step removed. So first me, Second, you. Third, them, <laughs> if you want to think about it that way. So first person plural would be we, us, our. Uh, second person is going to be the same, you and your. And third person would be they, them, the people, um, Tom and Jane, together, more than one, right? Um, so when we have go one by one when we have first person narration that is the narrator usually a character usually the protagonist in the story telling the events of the story from their point of view their personal point of view. So um, just to give one sentence to show what this would look like, um, I was nervous to start my new job. We have I, we have my, we know that the person is telling us this information directly, right? Um, once in a while, I have seen first person plural, but not very often. Um, a great short story, Rose for Emily, has uh, first person plural. It's told from the point of view of the town as a collective. So the plural first person here would be a group of people using we and us to tell the story. So in, in the case of a Rose for Emily, they have something like, um, we always thought Emily was a bit strange. That's not a quote from the story. I'm just giving you an example of that. Um, so that's what first person plural would look like. There's also a technique that's used uh, to great effect, and I've seen it more in contemporary books in the last like 20 years than I have um, noticed it in books written before that, and that is multiple first person. Now, this is not the same as plural. What this basically means is that um, in each chapter, there might be a different character telling their part of the story or telling the same story from their point of view. Now, you don't have to have a different character in every single chapter, but 
Um, if you think about um, some examples here, a book like Gone Girl, we have uh, the husband telling his side, the wife telling her side, and we go back and forth between their two views. Both of them are unreliable, so it's trying to figure out who's telling the truth and who's lying. Um, if you have ever read the Poisonwood Bible, um, that book has a number of different characters, and I think we cycle through them. We go through, um, there's a very large family with several children. We see things from their point of view in different chapters, and um, the story unfolds throughout the years um, from these different points of view. If you watch the show Lost, typically, um, even though it's not a it's not a book, so it's done a tiny bit differently, but we follow one character at a time in each episode. So we have a Kate episode, we have a Sawyer episode, we have uh, whatever the other people's names are that I'm blanking on right now because it's been like five years since I watched that show. But it's a really great example of multiple first person done really well. And in fact, the opening, uh, one of the opening shots starts with Jack's eye and, and pans out and then shows you what he's seeing. So you know that you're getting it from his specific point of view. So that's first person, pretty common in uh in stories um we also then have second person so second person is really not as common in fiction because the narrator is speaking directly to the reader it's used more often in things like political speeches persuasive writing so um we collectively we have a problem with global warming and you need to do something about it write to your congressman have the uh have them make sure that the factories are not polluting the air you should recycle as part of that right that kind of thing would be second person um i have seen it used extremely well in a few books but not many um Choose Your Own Adventure novels are always written in second person. I don't know if you've ever seen those or remember them. Depending on your age, you may not have seen them before. So it'll say something like, you walk into a dark cavern. There are two paths. Which one would you like to choose? And then it'll say something like, to go down path one, uh, go turn to page 83. To go down path to turn to page 27 and uh page 83 you die <laughs> and then you have to go back and go to page 27 anyway so you're not really choosing anything but um yeah uh, the there's a great book called please look after mom it's a book from korea and um she uses second person really well the beginning of the night circus sorry for the page flipping here the beginning of the book the night circus starts off with um you smell the scent of popcorn and caramel on the air before you hear the jangle of the circus. It's something to that extent. And it brings the reader in a bit to this story. The book You, um, if you've seen the show on Netflix, uh, the book is even more disturbing, um, as is the sequel. But the book You has a stalker, and so it's told um, in parts of it are told from a second person point of view because the stalker is putting himself in this girl's position and thinking that he can tell what she's what she's thinking and what she's feeling. So he'll say something like, um, you wore that dress just for me, didn't you? You knew how much I would like it. Ew, no, <laughs> she didn't. But um, it really increases the tension of the story by using that. I have not seen, other than Choose Your Own Adventure, I've not seen many books that are completely in second person. Typically, it's a um, it's a technique that people use like at the beginning of chapters to kind of draw you in or um, so you know how some books will have like a quote at the beginning or a little block. They'll have like a little second person thing and then it'll come into the rest of the story. So typically that is how um, that's used. The next is third person. There are two basic types, although to be honest, I kind of think of them as a continuum. Third person limited. Limited means that the narrator is outside the story. Um, 
third person. That's what that means. Um, but their knowledge is limited um, usually to one character. Um, Harry Potter does this really well. Um, there are things that Harry doesn't know um, because he's a child, and so the narrator doesn't reveal those things either. For the most part, other than a few bits and babs here, um, dribs and drabs is what I meant to say, but for, it, with, for the most part, we are following Harry and we know what he knows and we find things out as he finds things out. Now, sometimes it might be um, focused on um, one person in one chapter and another person in another chapter. Um, sometimes we follow one character um, in a chapter and then switch to a, another. Um, but uh, for the most part, well, either way, I guess. Um, then you have, so when you have that, what I mean, the, the knowledge is limited. We don't see the antagonist off, off, off screen. We only see them when they're interacting typically with the, um, the protagonist, the person that we're following. We don't know um, what other people are always thinking or feeling. Um, so what would an example of this be? Um, walked outside into the woods, nervous about which path to choose. So something similar to the choose your own adventure. So he, instead of I, right, talking about our subject, but we know how this subject feels. Um, maybe a friend comes up and we don't know what they feel, but um, on the, you know, it's not exactly the opposite end. I feel like this is kind of a continuum. Um, we have third person omniscient. They're never entirely omniscient, but essentially we know the thoughts, feelings, and sometimes the actions of many characters in a story. So we're not just, narration is not just focused on one or two um, I saw as an example, um, I, I was not able to read these books because of some of the violence and stuff in them, but, um, the George R. R. Martin books, um, Game of Thrones, the Game of Thrones series. He has several characters, it's, it's third person, but he has several characters that he kind of are his go-tos and he'll follow in different chapters. So it's closer to omniscience. Um, but complete omniscience would be kind of crazy storytelling. Um, uh, if you think about, oh, if you've ever read The Lovely Bones, in The Lovely Bones we have very interesting narration because it's uh, first person, but it's told from the point of view of um, a girl who has died, and so she's kind of looking down on everything and knows a little bit more than she would know if it was um, just straight first person point of view. But if you have a character, or I'm sorry, if you have a narrator kind of like that, that's looking over everything, um, you can. Um, you can have that. Um, my point is that even with a lot of books that are limited, we'll get hints here and there of what other people are doing. And, and with, with things that are omniscient, you don't want to do head hopping, which means you're going from this person, to this person, to this person, to this person, what they think, what they think. Um, it's too much. But um, here would be a, a, a weird example of third person omniscience. Let's take um, whoever this is about to go on the path. Um, trees were watching and the owls were their eyes. The white, oh, come on. The white owl in the tallest tree was ready to take flight. Is 
Unicorn is Mistress. That the boy was coming. Um, I'm thinking right now of the the Chronicles of Narnia, the line, the witch in the wardrobe, uh, somebody says even the trees are on her side, but I think it would be interesting to get a little bit of um, what the trees are seeing, what the owls are doing. So that's, that's kind of like what I'm, what an omniscient narrator would know, right? If we're just following him, um, maybe he sees the owl, but we don't know what the owl thinks or feels. So, um, Owl hooted in the distance and Trevor could hear its wings flapping as it took flight. So um, we have what he hears, what he feels, what he sees, um, but we don't have the owl's point of view. Here I think third person omniscience is a little bit more interesting, but um, maybe it wouldn't work for that story. So ultimately, um, as an author, your point of view is your filter. What I mean by that is every everything in your story comes from that singular perspective that you've chosen now i guess singular is wrong because i i know multiple first person and all that but the perspective that you've chosen so the number one rule here is no matter what <laughs> point of view you pick you have to be consistent. I see this mistake all the time. And I have not talked about verb tense, but I would say that verb tense kind of goes along, even though it's not technically part of it, verb tense goes along. And I will add that this includes verb tense. You can tell that this is one of my pet peeves. If you are writing in present tense, you stay in present tense. If you're writing in past, you stay in past, unless there is a distinct reason for it. Um, what I mean is you're having a flashback, you're having a flash forward, um, those kinds of structural changes in your plot. But otherwise, what you don't want to have, sorry, what you don't want to have is something like, um, I tell to go to the store I need milk and the baby is crying okay that's present tense tell oops need is crying okay you don't want to then have your next sentence be um Harry told me to go myself he was nasty and cruel and i don't understand why he won't just get some milk i almost added a word in there told was um why he will not uh, but told and was, right, you can't switch verb tense like this. And, and similarly, you cannot switch point of view. So you can't have it be um, first person and then all of a sudden we hear what the table thinks of this argument, right? Or the, the baby, we could maybe observe a baby crying, but we couldn't um, have the next sentence be... Um, the baby is, the baby hates when her parents fight. It makes her want to spit up everything she's just eaten. We can't have that if it's from the I tell Harry point of view, okay? So it needs to be consistent um, and, and, um, needs to be consistent um a third tip um first person can be more intimate more intimate way to tell your story you can fully know a character you can also play with um unreliability and you also have to know that it's going to be a bit biased so that's kind of uh 
uh, sometimes a problem and it is of course limited because it's from one person's point of view so positives or negatives depending on what your story is and what your style is and what you want to do with this um do you want to really intimate telling where you just fully know one character um maybe not but do you want to play around with unreliability? Do you want somebody who's biased and those biases come out? Do you want something that's limited because maybe you're telling a mystery and you want to hold things back? Um, there are other reasons for limitations too, but that's sort of a, a basic one, right? All of that. Um, second, second person can sound forced and awkward. And if you are trying to um, bring your reader in, but it can bring your reader in to the situation and make them feel part of the story. The difficulty is that second person can bring people in or it can turn people off. And so that's kind of a, the two sides of that coin. Again, um, I wouldn't make that the whole book, um, but it certainly is um, an idea. I know somebody who was working on an erotic novel that was told entirely from second person and I was like that could either really go well or that could be horrible um, <laughs> depending and I don't know if she ever wrote it um, but that would be interesting to find out. Um, third person oh the other thing about first person I forgot to mention um, is the likability factor. Um, if you want a really flawed hero and anti-hero, you know, it can work. I think Dexter might be told from first person point of view, really flawed. He's not entirely likable, but he's sort of got some likable qualities. Um, serial killer who hunts serial killers. If you're not familiar with the sort of basic premise of Dexter, um, that's essentially um, what that's about. Um, third person here, you kind of need to know which characters you want to follow. Um, it can let the reader make assumptions on their own, much more than the biased, really intimate first person point of view where a lot of times the narration is telling you how to think and feel because it's telling you what the protagonist thinks and feels but here with especially with third person limited you can make some of your own assumptions you can show with omniscience different aspects of the story um as long as you don't switch too quickly <laughs> do that head hopping And you can um, you can get a little bit of distance from the events. Sometimes that's good. Bird's eye view might be better than um, feet on the ground, right? So let's take a look at one of the few things that I've written ahead of time, but not much ahead of time. Um, okay. I tried to find there's a book that that has sections of second person and that book I don't remember the name of um, but essentially it's about a woman who has a child with special needs and um, they have a scene where her child breaks down in a grocery store and it's told from second person and at the beginning of each chapter she has these bits of second person um, narration and I wanted to find it for you, but I couldn't. So I instead just wrote a scene of a mom in a grocery store with a, a, a toddler who's having a little bit of a meltdown. So here is first person. I should have known better. By the time I stepped up to the grocery store checkout line, Tabitha was already rocking back and forth in her seat, moaning. She reached for the candy flanking the aisle, and I gently pulled her hand away. That's when she let loose a shriek that might have woken the devil. Every head in the store swiveled toward me and I felt my face grow hot. It was all I could do to stare straight ahead as a woman in line next to me mumbled, if she makes her daughter cry like that in public, you have to wonder what goes on behind closed doors. So we have this set up. Um, this is told from the mom's point of view, right? We see her watching the heads going toward her. We have this organic imagery of her face growing hot. 
Um, all she can do is kind of try to stare ahead and just check out her stuff. And now she has this, um, presumably a stranger, making this comment about um, her daughter, who's probably just little and tired, right? But you really can see things through her eyes here. Um, and the storytelling is, um, is quite... Um, Gently, I'm gently pulling her hand away. Is that true or is it not? Did she kind of slap it? We don't know. It might be biased, but it's kind of interesting. So let's look at this in, in second person. When the gossiping begins, you blame yourself. You should have known better. Your child is tired and stepping into another check into a checkout line with candy flanking both sides is the last place she needs to be right now. When she reaches for a chocolate bar, you pull her hand back and try to distract her. It's too late. She gives a scream to wake the devil and all eyes turn toward you, judging your every move. You try to stare ahead, ignoring your toddler's tears as a woman next to you mumbles. If she makes her daughter cry like that in public, you have to wonder what goes on behind closed doors. So we have here, comma that doesn't need to be here, um, but we have here, um, same scene, totally different tone, I think, because instead of just seeing things through this unnamed mom's eyes, we are pulled in intimately into the story. And I think that almost every parent that I know, I don't have kids yet, almost, but not quite, um, but almost every parent that I know has had a toddler have a tantrum at one point or another, and they feel a lot of times quite embarrassed, especially if this happens in public. So if you've had that happen, um, you can relate to this. If you haven't had that happen, you can kind of feel these strangers looking at you, their eyes turning toward you, they're judging you, they're gossiping about you, you're blaming yourself, um, and you're trying to ignore your toddler because just want to check your groceries out and go home. Um, let's take a look at third person limited and then we're going to open it up to third person um, omniscient. So now we have a name for the mom, Miranda. Miranda stepped out into the checkout line. It had been a long day and Tabitha, used to coming home right after daycare, was tired and cranky. She tried to ignore the beginnings of what was sure to be a full-blown meltdown as Tabitha rocked back and forth in her seat, moaning. Then, when the toddler's already sticky hands reached for the candy flanking the aisle and Miranda denied the request with a firm no, it was the last straw. Tabby let loose a shriek that might have woken the devil. Every head in the store swiveled toward the pair and Miranda turned red with embarrassment. Now, I've added a few details here because... Um, I, I wanted to kind of show you how, how this might, this might look and this might work, but we have, she, we're looking at Miranda. We get a little bit more, um, I don't think I used full blown meltdown before, but the, the basic facts are still the same, right? Still the same plot, still the same characters, but done totally differently. Um, and let's then head hop which I normally would not do in one scene. Um, but we're watching Miranda and now, and we're getting what she's thinking and feeling a tiny bit of what the baby is. Um, but that's really more Miranda's observations, right? So it's kind of limited to Miranda and her feelings. Um, so we're focused in just on her, right? Limited. And now we're going to open it up to the other people in the store. In the next line over, Mrs. Beatrice Bastion saw the commotion and swiveled to look faster than any other person in the place. Miranda's neighbor always had her nose in other people's business, and she had taken a disliking to Miranda almost from the minute they met. That girl is always crying, Beatrice thought, shaking her head. It's a damn shame that that mother doesn't take better care of her. I hope she's not being mistreated. She turned confidentially to the woman behind her and whispered in a voice loud enough for Miranda to hear. If she makes her daughter cry like that in public, you have to wonder what goes on behind closed doors. Okay, so the effect of this is that now we're taken away from the core story that we had of Miranda and Tabitha, um, and we're adding in a different point of view um, She's always crying, hope she's not being mistreated, and then I'm going to say this 
uh, I'm going to pretend to whisper, but I really want her to hear what I'm saying, right? Um, and so that's the effect, oops, <laughs> that's the effect of um, third person omniscience, that um, you're getting different perspectives, but you can also do that with um, first multiple first person narration. And which of these you would want to choose for your story would really be up to you. I can see the benefits and the disadvantages to kind of, I wouldn't write the whole thing in second for sure. Um, but the benefits of the third person omniscience is that maybe it would be interesting if we follow this mother and her daughter and we get um, what different people think of them and, and how, um, how mom shaming is a real thing and, and maybe um, you know, the meltdown happens, maybe somebody else in the parking lot sees her and thinks, oh, she's doing a great job. Oh, she's not putting her child in the car seat the right way. She should be doing that differently. Um, then maybe the, the dad, she comes home and her husband's there and Tabitha's dad says, why are her hands so sticky? And, um, and so it's just one person after another, um, blaming her for everything that has gone wrong with her child, right? Maybe that would really work well with third person omniscient. Maybe I just kind of like the style of um, the details that I can add with third person limited, but I just want to follow Miranda and see her day. Um, maybe I want to draw the reader in in certain points, and, and if I can do that without alienating them, I can use second person. Or maybe Miranda needs to tell her own story. Um, really, when it comes to that choice as an author, we're going to talk about style in a couple weeks, but um, that really could have to do with your style. Does somebody like Sophie Kinsella writes almost exclusively in first person present tense. Um, and some people love her books because of that, and some people hate them because they hate reading present tense. Um, other authors switch back and forth. I've written a couple books that are in um, first person and a few that are in third. Um, one that was third omniscient because I really wanted a wider view of the story. I had a number of characters and I wanted to be able to show what they were thinking and feeling, but it sort of also follows one particular character a little bit more. Um, and, and so again, on that spectrum between limited and omniscience, it's, um, hard to say, I guess. <laughs> hard to say, but, um, I would, I would lean toward calling it omniscient. Um, so... Yeah, it depends on your style, your preferences. What I'd like to kind of see you do either here or in some other assignments is just kind of play with this. Um, do I like telling things from a first person perspective? Do I like the um, distance I get from a third person perspective? Do I want to play a little bit and experiment with second person? It's it's up to you. So I'm excited to see what you have. and. Um, our examples for this week have to do with consistency, so make sure that you watch those because I think they can be really helpful in, in um, learning why consistency is important and how to make sure your, your point of view, whatever you pick, is consistent. Thanks, everybody.